here. So this is a discussion of a long-going collaboration with um, Frank Pullman's group uh, at Munich, who I was first thinking about this with, uh, as long as more um, as well as more recently, um, some of my students and postdocs at Berkeley. Um, so I think I don't need to give too much introduction to the idea of two-dimensional tensor networks, uh, most recently uh, known as the Pepson sots. Um, there's still a lot of open questions about this framework for simulating systems. Some of them are theoretically, like you know, what phases of matter can be well approximated by a PEPS? How does the, the error, say the fidelity precise, scale with bond dimension D, depending on what phase of matter you're in, say a chiral topological order versus a Fermi liquid, et cetera? Uh, but there's also practical questions still about how do we most efficiently uh, compute observables and actually optimize the tensors uh, given the Hamiltonian. I'm mainly going to be talking about this practical part. Um, so uh, Garnett talked about um, uh, th this problem earlier today. The basic thing you might want to do if you're going to treat uh, PEPS as a variational uh, algorithm is you need to compute the ground state or just the energy of a particular uh, PEPS, and then you're going to twiddle around with the tensors to try and reduce the energy. Um, so the easiest part of this to compute, one might think, would just be the norm of it. Um, so if you look at the norm, it involves taking two uh, copies of the PEPS and contracting them together. This kind of looks like computing a two-dimensional classical statmec model, roughly speaking. And of course, if you do it very naively, um, you need to sum over all the values of the indices. Uh, there's extensively many of them. And so you'd find that the number of terms uh, scales exponentially uh, with system size. Of course, there's slightly better ways to do the contraction, just like you can do matrix multiplication of uh, a one-dimensional tensor network, but even with the best way of doing it, um, you're going to end up with uh, an exact algorithm that would scale exponentially in either the width or depth of the circuit. Um, and of course, there's actually hardness results associated with evaluating these sorts of things, um, shown by Norbert, for example. So when you're going to approximate these things, either the numerator or the denominator, uh, some approximation is going to be uh, needed to evaluate these contractions. So there's many ways to do this, and there's been a long uh, history of improving on these methods. Many of the people who have um, developed are in the audience here. I'll just present one of the philosophies called the boundary MPS method. So the idea here is kind of like in DMRG, we're going to try sweeping iteratively from the left to the right. So let's imagine the result of the contraction to the left I've done. So this is a giant uh, tensor here corresponding to all the dangling uh, dimensions here. So it's a very high dimensional object. We call that the left environment. Let's assume that that left environment can itself be represented in some sort of matrix product form like this. So basically that it takes the form of a so-called boundary MPS. Uh, and that introduces a new bond dimension eta, which a priori has no relation to the bond dimension uh, of the tensors you started with. So I'm going to call it eta in this talk. Um, it was Kai in Garnet's talk. Um, so if you assume that you can get this object for, say, having contracted two columns, then to get uh, the result for the next is a simple iteration. You take uh, the boundary, and then you conjugate it um, by the operators of the bra and the ket and the peps. This kind of looks like MPO on MPS multiplication. And we know we can do matrix product state compression to bring this back to matrix product state form. And then you continue on. Um, so if you assume we do this from the left to get the left environment and the right from the right environment, uh, we can now represent this contraction as the contraction of two matrix product states, which we know can be done efficiently. Um, as far as I know, the most efficient way to do this, just in terms of how the scaling of things with um, the bond dimension of the boundary MPS and the bond dimension D of the PEPS, uh, uh, goes like this, for example, in uh, the bumps method uh, developed by Matt here. So empirically, it's found that generally you need to choose eta, which is much larger than d. So like a typical uh, calculation, say from Philippe Corbeau's that I'll show, you might use uh, peps, which is dimension 5, but then your boundary MPS is dimension 100. So environments are a big uh, cost for peps. Um, they also introduce not just you know, it's computing them. We now have pretty good algorithms for doing it. Um, they also are going to introduce uh, a lot of complications in the numerical um, procedures that I'll get back to later about if you want to locally perturb a tensor and ask, how does that change uh, the state globally? It's very difficult in these regular PEPs um, to go between that relation between local variations and the global change in the state uh, because these 
uh, the surrounding tensors um, don't define any orthonormal basis. So I'll come back to that. Uh, of course, PEPs, there's been, I think it's, it's a difficult algorithm to do. So it's, I don't, you know, it's not like uh, iTensor that you can just download and immediately get 12 digit precision. So there's not too many groups that do it, but nevertheless, it's very impressive. So this is, for example, the Heisenberg model from uh, Philippe Corbeau's. Um, one of the big developments, I think, recent, not too recently, but the last couple of years was to get the ground state. Originally, people used this full uptape, which was basically imaginary time evolution. That's the blue curve here. Um, but more recently, you know, in collaborations with the Ghent group and so on, it was figured out how to do variational update, much more like DMRG. Uh, and you find for the same bond dimension, doing these variational DMRG-like updates give you uh, much better precision. Uh, you can go beyond ground states. For example, this is uh, from one of Lauren's papers. He considers uh, plane wave excitations on top of the PEPs and uses to, for example, compute the spin wave dispersion uh, in the Heisenberg model. Uh, and one thing to keep in mind here is, of course, that the cost of the calculations is higher than, say, the d cubed you get in 1d. It's uh, d to the seventh, I believe, for the ground state. Or sorry, d to the tenth for the ground state. OK, so the summary of this talk is uh, I'm going to introduce um, this variation. It's kind of a subclass of PEPs, which we call isometric tensor network states. But different people besides us have uh, thought about it. In fact, um, there's a thesis which came up with this idea that Norbert pointed me to that came up with the idea 20 years uh, earlier in 1996. Um, I'll discuss a bit what we know about the variational power of the subclass of PEPs, uh, some algorithms, some more re uh, recent results on doing dynamics uh, and doing the fermionic version of this and extending it to the thermodynamic limit, uh, and then conclude with a couple big to-dos that I hope people here in the audience might uh, help out with. OK, so what's the basic idea of the isometric tensor network? Um, we want to get rid of the uh, environments altogether. So we'd like to enforce some condition on the tensors, such that if you were to compute this uh, boundary matrix product state, it would be trivial. Uh, it would just correspond to the identity operator. Uh, and you want a similar condition, not just for contractions from the left, but also from the north, south, east, and west. Um, and when we were thinking about this, there was actually two related papers, one from Garnet Chan's group uh, and one from Miles Studenmeyer here. OK, so let's um, figure out how we would do this in 1D. It's actually a very familiar um, idea. In 1D, it's called uh, the canonical form. Um, so in order to introduce the canonical form and the isometric tensor networks, I don't want to do too many equations. I want to do everything in terms of uh, pictures as usual. So what I need to do is introduce arrows. And if I draw a tensor that has incoming and outgoing arrows, it means it's an isometry. So an isometry is just a rectangular version of a unitary. So the incoming arrow you can think of as the big side of a rectangular matrix. The outgoing arrow is the small side. Uh, and we demand that if you do the contraction this way, it's going to give the identity matrix for the small number of degrees of freedom. But if you do it the other way, it's not a unitary. Uh, so you actually get a projection operator. So this is just going from the big side to, to small side. It orthogonally just projects out some of the degrees of freedom. Um, and if I'm going to represent these two conditions here as an equation, it just means if I take a tensor and contract over the incoming indices with its complex conjugate, uh, just tautologically, I get the identity. Uh, and I can extend this notation here. I've written it for matrices, but it extends to higher dimensional tensors. So if I have a tensor here with two incoming and one outgoing, as long as I contract uh, over all the incoming legs, I'm guaranteed to get uh, the identity. And you could do that. Does, there could be more outgoing than incoming legs as long as the outgoing total dimension uh, is smaller. Uh, and so you can generalize the rule to look something like this. OK, so in 1D, um, there's uh, this left-right canonical form. So the idea is that all you pick some bond, which we call the center. And to the left of it, you have all the uh, isometries are from the physical and the left incoming ceiling to the right. So it's like a flow from the left to the right and correspondingly from the right. And this is the MPS canonical form. Um, this is, I guess, the sense in which the density matrix renormalization group is a renormalization group. Uh, I can think of the big as like the UV degrees of freedom. There's many degrees of freedom. And every one of these isometries is a coarse grain, which throws out some degrees of freedom. So I can think of the flow. Uh, as I go from the left to right, is progressively uh, coarse graining the degrees of freedom until you get to the center. And that only keeps the relevant uh, contributions that show up, for example, in the entanglement spectrum. 
Now, one nice thing about the canonical form in 1D uh, is it's easy to show that any MPS can be brought into canonical form without changing the bond dimension um, just by the existence of QR or SVD. Um, so why does this condition lead to trivial environments? Uh, well, let's compute the norm just as before. It's just a simple iteration. If you look at the left, um, I've um, contracted over an isometry, so I just get rid of it for free, and then that just iteratively collapses in, and then you're left just with the central tensor, and the central tensor um, just amounts to computing its norm, which by the same convention is one. Okay, this also lets you compute observables uh, in the vicinity or the orthogonality center without eating, needing to know any of the uh, tensors far away. The reason is if you want to compute this expectation value, if the expectation value is where the orthogonality center is, that same iteration is completely uninterrupted and just for free, it reduces uh, to a local version here. So what that tells us is that the orthogonality center really tells you everything you need to know for any local expectation value in its vicinity. So how do we generalize this to 2D? It's a pretty obvious idea. Um, we're going to have, rather than just having the left and right, we're now going to have four quadrants. And in each quadrant, I demand that the tensors are in isometries from the physical leg and two of the ancillas into two of the outgoing ancillas. So it enforces this condition here. Uh, but what I do is in the four different quadrants, I have a different sort of like direction that the arrow of time is going. And then rather than meeting at a point, uh, these four different directions of orthogonality meet at a surface, which I can think of this cross here, which we call the orthogonality hypersurface, just because if you were to do this in larger dimensions, it would always be a co-dimension one object. And then that itself you can think of just as a matrix product state, which itself has a zero site uh, or a one site orthogonality center um, where the two cross. Uh, and I said, interestingly, states of this form, it, at least if you just kind of restrict your attention to one of these quadrants here, were actually pointed out in this uh, thesis of Suzanne Richter's in 1994. They didn't talk about it in terms of tensors. Um, it was sort of in the same language as finite, um, finitely correlated states before we thought about MPS. But. <clears throat> okay, so why does that mean the environments go away? Well, again, let's just compute the norm, and it's a sort of fun iteration. We can stop, start up at this top corner here, and we note that this tensor has all its incoming arrows contracted, so it goes away for free. And because that now produces the identity on the ancilla here, I have now contracted on over the, all the incoming arrows for this one, so that goes away for free, et cetera. And you, know, you immediately see that you can collapse all the tensors, for example, leaving behind only this 1D column here. And that 1D column is itself now uh, a matrix product state in canonical form, and so it reduces down to its center. Um, so what that clearly implies is that the uh, environment MPS that we had to look at before Coming from this contraction here, you just do the iteration from top to bottom and from bottom to top, and it gives you the identity. So this enforces um, what we wanted. All environments are going to be trivial. Um, it's not just true for like um, planes coming in from the left or right. There's a more general criteria, which is that if you choose any region um, such that at the surface or boundary of that region, you only have outgoing arrows, then if you were to contract these tensors um, with their conjugates, it would again give the, an identity environment now for this curve sort of boundary. So it's true for any space-like surface. It won't be true if I did a weird surface that, say, went, um, came out like this and back, because then you'd have an incoming arrow going into that surface. Um, so what's the physical interpretation of this uh, orthogonality hypersurface? Um, well, it really Unlike a PEPS, like if you take a regular non-orthogonal or non-canonical PEPS and just look at a column of it, you can't really think of that as being the wave function of the system um, because there's a lot of information which is encoded in the other tensors. Here, on the other hand, there's a very precise sense in which if you look at the orthogonality hypersurface, it is the wave function of the system expressed uh, in an orthonormal basis. And the reason is that if you take all these isometries to the left and contract them, you can think of that, the so-called boundary map, is a very large linear operator from the physical uh, Hilbert space in that region into the boundary ancilla. And by definition, because you've chained together a bunch of isometries, it's an isometry. So all the tensors to the left, you can just think of as an orthogonal change of basis from the physical degrees of freedom into the ancilla space. Um, so in that sense, this is the wave function of the entire many-body system expressed in orthogonal basis.
Um, and one of the reasons that's useful is suppose you want to, say, reduce the bond dimension for somewhere in the orthogonality center by, say, SVD truncation. Um, you want to make a small error when you do that. The error that's really meaningful is what's the change in the full two-dimensional state. Well, because uh, the, the orthogonality hypersurface is isometrically related to the full 2D state, the local notion of the Frobenius norm is the same as the global one. So because SVD is locally optimal, it ends up being globally optimal. Uh, and that's very useful because it means whenever you do a local truncation, it's globally optimal. Um, the orthogonality surface also, for example, encodes all the entanglement properties. If you want to know what is the entanglement entropy of A, the whole region, you don't actually need to know the tensors inside it because that's just like a unitary transformation. It would actually just be uh, sufficient to know this matrix product state um, on the corner there. <clears throat> okay, so how do you compute two-point functions? Um, it's very similar to this trick in 1D where everything collapses down to the orthogonality surface. Let's assume conveniently that I want a two-point function um, where my orthogonality surface, um, uh, where the two points happen to lie somewhere on the orthogonality surface. You can make it more general than just a cross. You could have the four quadrants meet in this uh, way here. Uh, and then the idea is when you do the, the contraction, all the tensors here just go away for free by analogy to in 1D. Um, and then it just collapses to uh, a contraction like this. But now it just looks exactly like the expectation value of a two-point function for the matrix product state defined by the orthogonality center, which we know how to compute efficiently. Um, so it basically allows this dimensional re uh, reduction for computing observables from the 2D to 1D. Now, one corollary of this is that if you have an isometric tensor network in which the orthogonality center has a finite bond dimension chi, it's going to need to have exponentially co decaying correlations, because we've argued here that you can reduce the correlations to those of an MPS uh, whose bond dimension is bounded by uh, eta, and those decay exponentially. I'll come back to that, though. Um, you can imagine a slightly more general version of ISO TNS, where the tensors here are finite bond dimensionals, but you can imagine that you have an infinite bond dimension for the orthogonality center, and it turns out that those can have algebraic correlations. Okay, but that was very convenient that I chose the, uh, the two observables to lie on the orthogonality center. In general, they might lie somewhere in the bulk like this. Um, and then if you try and do the same trick, what you'll find is your isometry condition will do well for a while until you hit this perturbation, and then it spoils everything in its causal cone, and these tensors won't go away for free. So you'd be left with a finite volume of a 2D uh, network that you have to uh, compute. So the general philosophy of what we're going to do in that situation uh, is we're going to have to invent a way, just like in 1D, of moving the orthogonal form so that the way that these quadrants glue together can be shifted over, and then if you can do that, you can always shift your orthogonality centers to lie wherever the two-point functions are um, and then go on from there. So this procedure for shifting around the orthogonality center, uh, we call the Moses move for reasons I will get back to. Okay, so before discussing algorithms for the shifting over the orthogonality center and finding the ground state and so on, let's discuss a little bit what the variational power of the ISO TNS is. Um, so clearly it's a, a subset of PEPs. It's a strict subset. One way we know that is PEPs, for example, um, a finite dimension PEPs can represent states with algebraic correlations, like this famous ice, icing PMS, icing, um, icing uh, PEPs, whereas the ISO TNS, at least if it has finite orthogonality center, we said has exponential decay. Um, so you might worry that it's just not a useful subset of PEPs, and whatever you know, um, benefits you got won't be worth it. Uh, but in fact, we have a kind of general result about the variational power. Um, this was developed by my students, uh, Tomo so Ajima and Karthik Siva, they prove two things. Um, one, any string net state, like the Levin-Wen string net states, uh, have an exact ISO TNS representation. So very early work by you know, Giffrey and others had shown that uh, all string nets have PEPs representations, but it's not so obvious that you can actually make the tensors uh, isometries. Um, uh, it turns out that, that you can, um, and it's conjectured that any 2D gapped phase of matter whose edges are gappable, meaning it doesn't have, for example, chiral topological order, like the fractional quantum Hall effect, um, uh, is in the same phase of matter as a string net, and those string nets uh, can be written as ISO TNS. Okay, but that's about a very particular class of model wave functions. Um, the next thing we show is that if you have an ISO TNS, uh, 
and you apply a finite depth circuit to it, then it still has an exact ISO TNS representation. Uh, of course, the bond dimension goes up, but in principle, you still have an exact representation. So if you put those two things together, uh, what that kind of means is that the model wave functions are very low bond dimension, ISO TNS, and you can think of applying local uh, unitaries as taking each of these special points and it, extending it into the general phase of matter. You know, schematically, we'd say all uh, 2D phases of, all gap 2D phases with gappable edges should have an ISO TNS form. Um, that leaves behind some interesting examples like the fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, now, this result might not be the most useful thing we want to know. The useful thing we want to really know is what's the error to approximate a state with a given bond dimension. We don't have a result like that. Yeah. Uh, is the statement that uh, all string net states have an exact ISO TNS form of fixed bond dimension? That yeah, so it'll be de system? bond dimension that just depends on the number of anions in the theory. Right. Like, okay. Good. It's, it, it's not much higher dimension than like for PEPs. It's just you need to do a bunch of manipulations and use the properties of the F symbols to show that you can make each one um, an isometry, but it doesn't increase the bond dimension very much. Okay. Yeah. Another interesting thing about the variational power of the ISO TNS is that they're all very easily prepared on a, a quantum computer. Um, and it's easy to explain. It's just a simple generalization of ideas from uh, Ignacio Sorok and others in 1D. Um, and the way we're going to think about this is one way to obtain an isometry is to instead uh, act with a unitary. So this blue here is a unitary gate, where one of the incoming um, um, qubits for the unitary you just fix to be in a known state 0. So if you just contract in this known state zero with, say, a two by two unitary, that gives you a three-site isometry. Um, so in this way of thinking about it, um, because we're applying the unitary to a fixed known state, this naturally always makes time go from this, these two states here. I'll think of these as the input to the output. Um, so unfortunately, we're going to need to change the notation to switch to this other point of view. My original point of view, the arrows went from big to small, and I did that because it's kind of like RG. Um, but if I instead want to think about this as a quantum process, the time, as I said, needs to go from uh, the small to the big because it has to act on this uh, fixed qubit here. If you went the other way, it would be like doing post-selection, and that's, that's not very physical. Okay? So for the next couple slides, unfortunately, I'm going to switch uh, the meaning of all the arrows, and I can now think of arrows as a temporal time project. Uh, process. Okay, so how do you prepare uh, an ISO TNS on a quantum computer? Well, you'll first start out uh, with your quantum computer in uh, a product state with your uh, qubits in, um, in a lattice here. So there's going to be one qubit per site and then some extra qubits uh, lying at the boundary. And then what you can see is each of the isometries we can now promote to a unitary, uh, and I can proceed temp uh, temporally. So I start in the or so-called orthogonality hypersurface here at the first one. I can just view this as a 3 by 3 unitary gate acting on these fixed product states, and it makes three now entangled qubits. One of them I leave behind. That's going to be the, the, physical, the physical spin. And the two of them fly to the north uh, and to the east. And then I can, say, move on to applying this gate, which now has these three as the incoming and these three as the outgoing. And you can see, as long as I kind of follow the arrow of time here, this just gives a sequential uh, set of unitary gates, which exactly then prepares the quantum computer in the state uh, of the ISO TNS. Okay? Um, there was a recent paper by uh, Ignacio discussing this. Um, he calls them sequentially generated states. So this point of view is kind of uh, useful for reinterpreting what the isometries are doing. So you can see if you view this, um, you have these flying qubits which are propagating um, from, say, the bottom up this way following uh, the flow of time. You can think of their dynamics as just a type of open quantum dynamics, right? So the most general form of open quantum dynamics is that you, you, know, you have your system of interest, some new degrees of freedom come in, you act unitarily, and then you forget about those degrees of freedom. The degrees of freedom we're forgetting about are exactly the physical degrees of freedom. Um, and because if you just forget about these and ask what is the uh, resulting dynamics just on the ancillas, that corresponds to open quantum dynamics. So in this interpretation, the transfer matrix or the like transfer column 
uh, the ISO TNS becomes the quantum channel, uh, which represents those uh, open quantum dynamics acting the on, on the ancilla. And this uh, orthogonality column in the thermodynamic limit becomes whatever the state is of that quantum channel. Sorry, the steady state of that quantum channel. Um, so this point of view, I think, is kind of useful for actually going back, for example, to thinking about, well, can ISO T and S represent algebraic correlation? So originally I said if the orthogonality center has finite bond dimension, then no. Uh, but what if the orthogonality center formally I let actually have infinite bond dimension, so I don't demand it as a matrix product state form, while still keeping all the isometries in the four quadrants uh, finite? Um, so it turns out this point of view, you can easily construct some examples which show that you actually can get algebraic correlations. Uh, and I'll only do this at a very high level. This is a work, uh, work in progress that we'll post something on soon, I hope. So the idea is, if I was going to try and get a state like this to produce algebraic correlations along some direction, it must arise because the, the ancilla, as they undergo these open quantum dynamics, must have some power law correlations in time and space. So what we need to do is cook up some 1D quantum non-equilibrium dynamics that exhibit power laws. Uh, and that's not easy, that's not hard to do. Um, for example, you can just take a classical probabilistic stellar automaton uh, that represents uh, percolate, percolation or asymmetric exclusion process. Uh, and it's easy to come up with these probabilistic stellar automaton that show power laws in time. Um, for example, they might be governed by KPZ dynamics. And any classical probabilistic stellar automaton you can promote to a quantum one. Uh, to a quantum channel. And so when you do that, you can come up with uh, examples of these iso TNS that then have algebraic correlations, which are the same as those of these uh, probabilistic cellular automaton. Uh, so the conclusion from that is twofold. When we were originally thinking about this, we kind of thought that no matter how you chose the bulk tensors, to good approximation, you should be able to find an orthogonality center with finite eta. Um, I guess that's not true, because if you happen to choose bulk tensors, which correspond to one of these uh, critical uh, 1D non-equilibrium dynamics, it means that the steady state itself has power laws, so it won't have a super easy uh, matrix product state representation. Um, and if you find a state like that, um, then the ISO TNS has algebraic correlations, and it would be at least more difficult uh, to simulate classically. Okay, so let's move on to some algorithms. Um, three, this is from the original paper, so it's sort of old, and then in four, I'll discuss some of the more recent updates. Um, so the basic thing we need, and this is the chief problem with this ISO TNS method, um, is we need a way to move the orthogonality center around. So in 1D, this is very easy to do just because of the uh, existence of uh, many different orthogonal matrix uh, decompositions. So the idea is I want to uh, go from a canonical form here, move the orthogonality center over. It's sufficient to just look locally. So I'm going to take the two sites um, that are involved in the switch, I first contract them together, and you can just think of this as the usual, it's the wave function of the system in the two-site basis. And then you can do any orthogonal matrix factorization like QR, and just interpret Q now as the isometry, and R as the new orthogonality center, and see that it verifies that the orthogonality center is switched over. Of course, really any orthogonal de decomposition will do, so I've done QR here, but you could also do, say, uh, SVD, and choose U, uh, to be the isometry and SV to be the new orthogonality center. Uh, and that's just because, you know, this canonical form actually has a unitary ambiguity. You could in insert any unitary uh, resolution of the identity on these bonds and you'd still preserve the canonical form. And you can use that to choose whatever properties of lambda you want. So, for example, in Giffrey's canonical form, um, you use SVD and you can force lambda to be, di to be diagonal. So we need, kind of need the, the same thing in 2D. Uh, if I want to move the orthogonality center over um, uh, from left to right, I can focus in just in the two columns in question. So I start out with lambda b. I can contract those together, and I can just think of this thing as a matrix product state that has, uh, it's like a two-column matrix product state. Okay, and apparently what I need to do, so what I've done here is I, I've just grouped together the physical degree of freedom and the ancilla degree of freedom into the degrees of freedom on the left and similarly on the right. And what I need is to take this two-sided matrix product state and find a way to split it in two, but in the opposite way that I started from. I now want the isometries to be on the left and the orthogonality center uh, to be on the right. So if we could do that, you'd also be able to do an equivalent move um, north to south. We could then move the orthogonality center around. Um, 
So this you can phrase as a very complex nonlinear variational problem to uh, decompose a matrix product, a two-sided matrix product state um, subject uh, to these isometry constraints. Yeah. Point up, like wouldn't you think that this would be a central site, or is that? Yeah, it's up to you. Um, it's sort of up to you. So um, as I've drawn it here, it's kind of like the orthogonality, at least on the finite version, the orthogonality, I'm always using, doing this T form. OK, I see. Um, note that, so one sort of subtle thing here is for a matrix product state, you can easily flip up to down very trivially. So when I've done the Moses move here, I've decided to make these up and these up. The lambda, if you want later, you could flip them to be down, because that you can just view as a matrix product state, and you can flip it. But the A, you, you, there's no easy way to flip up to down. You'd have to join them back together into this form, you could, and then you could do the backwards process of it. Yeah. Anyway, so there, there's a general version of this where you instead have it like meet in the middle, if you want. Yeah, that's probably the answer to your question. OK, so. <clears throat> In a sense, I said there's a unitary ambiguity when you do this. So kind of what we're doing here, it's not like QR, where you chose it to be rectangular. A is like our Q. And the R, rather than demanding that this thing be rectangular, we're just trying to demand that it has low entanglement so that it has a nice matrix product state form. So a big problem here, though, is unlike 1D, where QR doesn't increase the bond dimension, uh, in general, unless you have, for example, these uh, fixed point states like the, the string nets acted on by finite depth unitaries, this can only be done approximately, and that's going to introduce uh, errors into the uh, algorithm. It's a little bit analogous to the errors introduced in regular PEPs, where you need to compute uh, the boundary tensors only approximately, or the boundary environments. Um, so the original way we figured out to do this, yeah. Well, um, so why you should be able to even approximately do this? Um, I mean, I guess my intuition, well, I think it's a little bit subtle for whether you should be able to approximately do it, because we, we just discovered, for example, that if these tensors correspond to one of these critical like dynamics that are, quant that are like open critical, then as you kept doing this, you'd be trying, the lambda is basically a purification for the steady state of those dynamics. Um, and if those dynamics develop power laws, then as you do this, it must be that the eta needs to keep increasing. So th th like, I think it's probably hard to argue in general that it's possible because we can construct examples where there won't be a fixed point way of doing this, like if you start out with one of these critical states. Um, I'm asking as if yeah. 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 In the contraction of the normal for pets, for instance. But are you finding now that you still have to pay the price at this point? Yeah, I think we don't know yet. And the reason is um, there's a very quantitative thing you need to do. So this induces an approximation. It's kind of, a, in a way, a, a single layer picture of what you'd be doing with boundary MPO. In a way, you could think of it that way. Um, the scaling of this is cheaper than in PEP. So like here you get d to the 7 versus d to the 10. But until you can show how does the energy scale with the bond dimension, you can't really tell which is actually better yet. And um, so far, we've only implemented imaginary time evolution, which I would say doesn't work. I mean, it works, but it doesn't work particularly well. So I think we're sort of holding off on whether this whole pro program works or not until we actually do the variational update. Um, where we can just compare, like, say, the Corbeau's variational peps versus here and see as a function of bond dimension, does the fact that it's d to the 7 versus d to the 10 actually help you or not? So I think I honestly don't know the answer yet. Yeah. Um, so the way we solve this, at least in the finite case, is something called the Moses move that named Roger came up with. Um, and 
the reason we call it that is it's an iterative algorithm where you start at the bottom and there's a kind of cool procedure where you look at this like three-party wave function and you need a way to figure out how this degree of freedom here should be split in two. Um, and when you do that, it lets you kind of rewrite it as this and then it lets you unzip it and you move up like that. Uh, the, the where this name came from is he thought of it as unzipping the sea of entanglement. So like, if you have some degrees of freedom down here, those degrees of them are partly entangled with stuff to the upper left and partly entangled with stuff over to the right. And somehow the interpretation of what these isometries should do is it says the part of this Hilbert space which is entangled with the right, you should send right, and the part of the Hilbert space which is purely entangled with the left, you should send left. Very cartoony if you had like just a product state of bell pairs, that's what it would be doing. Um, so what you should be doing after you strip off A, you get a new renormalized state lambda, and the entanglement in lambda between the north and south should be stripped off of any correlations which were purely between the lower left uh, and the upper left, very schematically. Okay, so how do you do TBD? Maybe I'll skip over this quickly. Then, yeah. Yeah, one to two is kind of the heart of the algorithm. You need to take it's a. I think it's an interesting. It's an interesting subproblem that actually shows up in like the old way of, um, like Giffrey's original way of thinking about Mera and so on. So the basic problem is you start out with a wave function on three parties A, B, C. Um, and unfortunately, I don't have the picture here. If you can, what you basically need to do is this isometry you can think of as taking party A and finding a tensor product defactorization of it into an A left and A right. Um, and kind of what this original move I to two does is it says, what way can I take this three-party wave function, take this Hilbert space A and split it into an A left and A right, such that the resulting four-party wave function has some low entanglement between two and two of the parties. Uh, and it turns out if you insert that new renormalized four-party wave function here and then contract it and bring it up, it looks like that. Yeah, sorry I don't have the, the figure for it, but that, that's kind of the sub part of it. Uh, and the routine you need to do is some like nonlinear optimization subject to the isometry constraint. So it's related, for example, to Romanian optimization, which is actually how we did it in this paper back in 2019. Okay, so the nice thing, um, in addition to not having the environments, um, if you have ISO TNS and you can do the Moses move, then any 1D algorithm can easily be turned into the 2D algorithm as a nested for loop. Um, with almost no modification. So I think that's the really nice thing about this. So, so TBD, for example, is what we've implemented at the moment. So I don't think I need to review uh, Giffrey's 1D TEBD. The way we're going to do it is not odd even bonds, but this uh, uh, left to right way of doing the Trotter decomposition. Uh, and of course, a key conceptual part of TBD um, was that if you locally do SVD, if you assume that your orthogonality center is always at the location when you've applied your gates, then the local SVD is actually optimal for the full 1D state. Uh, and that's what the ISO TNS buys us here. We get the same property. Okay, so the way we're going to do the trotterization is we're going to assume the Hamiltonian is a sum of rows and a sum of columns. And then in each row or column, we do this same 1D type trotterization. Uh, and then we're going to apply all the columns, and then we're going to apply all the rows. And then you keep doing column row, column row. Um, so let's start out and try and apply the first column. Well, if I'm going to be applying the first column, naturally I want to start out in the orthogonality center um, off to the left here. And the key thing is so long as I'm just applying gates to the orthogonality center, the entire rest of the network can just be viewed as a unitary change of basis and is totally irrelevant. So when you apply this, you can do the globally optimal way of applying these gates to the ISO TNS by literally calling the 1D TBD method um, to the matrix product state defined by the orthogonality center. So you don't need environments. There's no difference between the simple and the full update. It ends up being the same thing here. Um, you just call 1D TBD. Okay, and now you can see I told you TBD, it's going to be like TBD squared is going to be a double for loop of the regular TBD. Well, I've now applied <laughs> the analog of one gate and 1D TBD. I now just need a sweep left to right. So what you do is you do the Moses move to bring the orthogonality center over by one, so now it's here. Uh, and once you've done that, 
and the orthogonality center is on the second column, you apply 1D TBD to the second column, and so on and so forth, and that sweeps you to the orthogonality center being that form uh, here. Uh, and when you work this out, you get something which is like a D to the seventh algorithm, um, which I believe compares with D to the seventh for the full update with boundary. I don't know if there's an improvement on that now. This is 2 plus 1D. You're going to find you can do time evolution of a 2D quantum state. Um, so that's done the columns. To do the rows, you can just, I won't really illustrate it. Um, you can see if you're going to do the rows, it's just now sweeping from the bottom to the top, which is just what I just did, but rotated by 90 degrees. So you have this kind of cool sweep where you sweep this way, and then you sweep this way, and then you sweep this way, and then you sweep this way. And you're doing that, it gives you a second order Trotter decomposition. Um, so for example, I'll just illustrate this. People are, in this audience, people are going to be angry. I'm not going to show like four-digit precision versus bond dimension. Sorry. I'm just going to show some pictures. Uh, but this is an application computing the spectral function of the transverse field Ising model. But it's in 2D, so it's non-trivial in this case. Um, so first, we use imaginary time evolution on, I believe, a 10 by 10 lattice to get the ground state uh, for different values of the transverse field. And then you can flip a spin and then use the exact same TBDI algorithm now in real time uh, to compute the dynamical structure factor just as a two-point function. Um, so what this is showing here is for a particular, this is momentum versus uh, energy uh, for the structure factor. Um, uh, we can compare it versus second-order perturbation theory, either st starting from strong or weak coupling. That's the solid curves here. You see naturally at g equals 1 and g equals 5, it agrees quite closely. Uh, there's an interesting feature which shows up if you look at g equals 1. It's rather faint, but you'll see um, there is an additional band that shows up here. That corresponds to the fact that in a ferromagnet, you can actually have a bound state of two magnons. So you can think of it as two um, flip spins will want to be next to each other because of the J term. Uh, and you actually series, see a series of three resonants coming from various uh, multi-magnon uh, bound states. So the ISO TNS correctly gets that. Um, at g equals 3, you'll see a finite gap open. I'm not sure how much of that's the ISO TNS versus just the fact that it's a 10 by 10 system, so it's, it doesn't actually have a gap. Uh, the critical point is like 3.04. Yeah. I think on 10 by 10, I'm not sure 3 versus 3.04 would look any different. Um, so most recently, all of that was, um, I guess, up through 2021. Um, naturally, we want to be able to do ISO, or infinite ISO TNS in the thermodynamic limit. So the basic uh, stumbling block for that is you need a way to do an infinite Moses move. So you can imagine, um, let's start out small and just make it infinite in the north-south direction, but keep it finite in the east-west. You now have this orthogonality column, which you need to s uh, sweep from left to right. So the basic problem you need to solve, and I'm hoping someone in the audience could actually maybe help us solve it better, because this is sort of the, the, the stumbling block, is to take an infinite matrix product state um, on two columns that has a left and right arrow, and then you know, do the same thing of splitting it into isometries in a renormalized orthogonality column. Um, so we have some ways to do this via fixed point methods, but you can easily see that it, there's various local minima in this landscape. And depending on how you initialize it, you can get different good but different um, solutions to this. And it ends up making the uh, resulting simulations look a little bit kind of noisy, because depending on which of these minima you find, the numbers are slightly diff different. And I do not want to be working with an algorithm that behaves that way. So hopefully someone can help us figure out uh, the better way to solve this uh, fixed point problem. Could I ask a question on this one? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one might imagine that your Moses move, as you're unzipping, you get small errors at each point. And yeah. in this infinite case, they may accumulate. Yeah, I mean, you always, you know, sorry. So there are Moses exact states. Yeah. Uh, and I guess they would naturally be fixed points of this. Is it, does this yeah. lead you to Moses exact states in the infinite case? Um, well, yeah, so you can do, so, well, so first, we always probably expect, like, you, you need to measure as a fidelity per site. So, of course, the global fidelity will be zero but you'd measure the fidelity per site, and it won't be 1. For the string net states, that's an example where it's 1. Um, you can do something where you can um, repeatedly solve the Moses move just back and forth. And each time, you accumulate a little bit of an error, but you see that the state seems to drift towards some sort of fixed point. 
uh, but it's a rather large bond dimension fixed point. So I, I don't know that it could, presumably it's interpreted as like, I don't know, it's an interesting open question. Like as, as you do this, it moves towards some fixed point. It's not getting a particular string net, like it's some bond dimension 27 fixed point or something. So I don't know, it's an open theory question like, what is the space of all MPS that have an exact fixed point relation to this? We know there's some solutions, like the string nets. Um, what is the space of all of them? I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, we don't end up solving this. We, we use the what we call the Moses move, this unzipping is like an initialization. It works really well as an initialization. But then we just do the left side minus the right side squared, and then you can do Romanian op, you can do you know, nonlinear conjugate gradient or you know, various optimization routines on it. So we end up just kind of solving the same thing you did, but you need to phrase it in terms of fixed points because you're in the thermodynamic limit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I would need to, I'm not sure if the variation, um, I don't know if the point to point scatter comes from, the Moses move itself needs to get initialized in some way. Uh-huh. Yeah, good. Yeah, let's talk about that afterwards. I mean, this is sort of like, I would love to talk about this with people here, because that's the. <clears throat> um, maybe I'll skip this. Yes, I'll skip this, just showing the Moses move. Um, recently, we did the fermionic version. There's a bunch of minus signs, as many of you know. Um, here's the energy error for fermionic ISO TNS on a 10 by 10 lattice. Again, we just do imaginary time evolution. This is showing, we do mainly free fermions, so we can exactly compute it. So this is an energy error here. One is a Dirac spectrum, so it's a semi-metal. Another is a trivial insulator. You could do a superconducting P plus IP superconductor. You could do a churn band, not interacting. And all of these are energy error versus tensor dimension. Um, interestingly, some of these, for example, are chiral topological orders, these two. This one's gapless. But when you look at the convergence here, it's not obvious, at least at this scale, that they behave any different than the trivial insulator. I'm sure asymptotically they do, but, but not yet. Uh, and of course, the nice thing about a tensor network is I can turn on interactions. So I can add, say, a Hubbard U in the churn band case, um, and you get the same, same behavior. Here's, I'll conclude with uh, one movie. So this is, we find the ground state of a churn insulator. So a churn insulator is a analog of the integer quantum Hall effect which has these notorious chiral edge states. That's supposed to be one of the origins of the difficulties for representing it as a PEPs. Uh, and then what we can do is after we find the ground state, we act with the electron creation operator in a corner somewhere by the edge. And then we can do real-time evolution. And if it's getting things correctly, we should see that this electron uh, just runs around the edge uh, in a chiral fashion. So uh, here is the ISO TNS simulation. Uh, compared with, we'll do it for free fermions at Zach, just the exact solution. And you see you get more or less the same result, modulo some noise that shows up kind of everywhere, which is probably the fact that we don't exactly have the ground state. Uh, and then naturally you can um, do this with interactions and you see the same effect. Um, one kind of cool thing is, is the interacting case is different than non-interacting case. You see that the velocity at the edge actually gets renormalized upwards, which is a known effect. Okay, so future directions. I discussed um, doing infinite by finite, uh, but naturally we want to embed this and make it infinite by infinite. Um, so taking the full thermodynamic limit. The big to do, I think, before I'll decide whether this is a successful or failed program is to do a variational update by analogy to DMRG. The difficulty there, just like for regular PEPs, is thinking about what's the most efficient way to compute the environment. It's gonna be a fun algorithm because it's like you'll you want to do DMRG on one of the columns, like literally, but you, to do that, you need to get the MPO, uh, which represents the projection of the Hamiltonian onto the degrees of freedom of that. But once you do that, you'll just call the regular 1D DMRG and then sweep left to right like DMRG, so it will be DMRG squared. Um, and what we're working on now is just 
most efficiently getting the MPO representation for the effect of Hamiltonian for one of those columns. So that's good to do. Um, but it may be that to get this to work nicely, we need some uh, further improvements or the Moses move, or it could be that this was uh, not actually any better than doing PEPs. I think we just don't know yet. Yeah. And then if it works, we want to actually do something important. Like, you know, solve for the magic angle graphene or something. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mike. We're a bit over time, but let's take uh, one or two questions if there are some. Okay, Gifre. Can you use your seat, Mike, please? If you try to do the MRG, yeah. Um, do you? How do you compute the effective Hamiltonian? Uh, yeah, there's there's different ways to to do it. Um, we might need to do it on the chalkboard. So. Um, you, you cannot use any more uh, isometric character, right? Well, so the idea is we want, um, uh, there's actually a way to do it just using the Moses move, which is kind of interesting. So um, suppose to start, so w let's imagine, this might be a kind of long answer, okay. actually. Yeah, let, let's discuss it afterwards. <clears throat> okay, Garnet. Use your seat mic, please. Oh, I have to press down and let go. Yes. OK. All right, it's just holding it down. OK. Uh, so uh, do, you re do, you, but do you think this would be good? Do you think this is, you know, it's more complicated because you have lots of two-point things. Do you think this, you would encourage investigation of this for long-range interactions or not? I think the, the first thing we're going to do is, um, handle any Hamiltonian, which is a sum of like 1D MPOs for columns and rows. Um, but that will probably not be like general enough for say quantum chemistry, because you'll have crazy diagonal things. Um, so I think it's an interesting direction whether one should think about PEPOs, for example. Um, so, you know, one way you could go about this is you could take the PEPO and then conjug you know, do basically use an MPO to keep track of the of the environment just by anal uh, analogy to one D. So that'd be <laughs> one way to present to potentially deal with completely arbitrary interactions. Um, but yeah, I don't know yet. I think a key thing will be that you'll need to use like the MPO compression as you go. Because my point of view is if if I go back to this um, There's two ways, oh wait, so where did I put it? Uh, I may be lost. So um, as Giffrey pointed out, if once you insert an observable somewhere, it spoils the isometry condition. And if you think of it in the time evolution picture, it's like doing open quantum dynamics of some operator. So it, it's a lot like what Tibor talked about. You're gonna have this operator which will grow, um, but it's dissipative quantum dynamics. Um, so that will tend to make it not get arbitrary complicated, but it will actually converge to something so long as the transfer matrix is gapped. So one way of going about this would be that you take each term in the Hamiltonian and then you'd find the fixed point under the evolution of the transfer matrix and that operator shouldn't get too complicated so it should have an MPO representation. That'd be one way to do it. <laughs> 